I'm the driver, you're the road. <laughs> Distracted drivers and the lives they ruin now on Carpe Diem. and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Mark Efron, professor of journalism, television and digital media in the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. We're about to meet Laura Carney. She works at Good Housekeeping Magazine. She was 25 when her life was changed by a phone call. If I were to define distracted driving I would say it's something that's been a problem for a long time. People have always driven distracted in some way or another. It's only been in the past decade or so that technology has become more of a definition of distracted driving. It was August 8th, 2003. My father was uh, killed by a teenager who was driving on her phone. I saw him five days before he was killed. Um, my husband actually met him just one time five days before he was killed. She was lost going to either a, f a relative's house or a family friend's house, I'm not sure. And she pulled off the highway. She was in a large SUV, like a Ford Escape. She had both of her siblings in the car with her. Um, and she got, you know, she just was flustered, I guess, because she was lost. So she picked up the phone and called for directions. My father was waiting to turn left and she was coming down this way. And it, was, it would have been about two seconds. But to me, that's a short conversation. But the witnesses, there were seven different witnesses who came in and they said they saw her like this. So I personally believe that she was still holding it. Um, people saw her holding it. And I just think it was an attention blindness where you think you're seeing everything, but you're really seeing about this much. And that could be a street light down the road. Um, she thought the light was green. You know, there's no way that light could have been green. They went, she said, maybe it malfunctioned. They went and they checked it. There wasn't malfunctioning. Um, so essentially my dad pulled out to turn left and she just rammed right into him. And when you have an SUV of that size in a compact car, it was like a Mercury Cougar my dad was driving. It's like, there's no, you have no chance. I didn't even make the connection at all to the phone. I just thought it was a fluke accident. Um, I went about a decade thinking that and one day I was at Good Housekeeping, I was at work and a story came across my desk and it was about a man who had created something like a group called Undistracted Driving because his daughter, his 21 year old daughter had been crossing through a crosswalk in Ocean City, New Jersey coming from her job and a man ran a stop sign and ran her over um, and she just died in the hospital and the last thing she said was I want my mom. Technology in itself, uh, it, it's a large component that's responsible for it. Um, you have uh, smartphones now that can basically uh, do so many things. So it distracts the driver, uh, whether it's social media, messaging, uh, and even cars now. Cars have uh, LCDs, multimedia screens, that uh, take away whether it's a split second uh, of attention from the road. Your brain, after you look down at your phone when you're at a red light, which is, I think most people who are pretty good about not driving distracted still do that. From what I understand, that they think it's okay. They think, oh, well, I'm not driving right now, so it's okay. The truth is, after you put that phone away, your brain takes 27 seconds to refocus on driving, um, which is scary because a red light is longer than that. You know, and some, a lot of times you'll see someone at an intersection and you have to honk because they're not going and it's usually, you know, you can kind of assume that's probably what they're doing. Between uh, 2010 and 2014, about 820,000 uh, accidents uh, reported were due to uh, distracted driving. 
uh, in 2014, uh, nationally, there were about close to 4,000 accidents that uh, involved the use of a cell phone or some sort of uh, distraction. I spent a decade of my life being afraid to talk about this. And the day that I decided I'm okay with talking about this, everything changed. So I've been working on this new project um, called My Father's List, and it is essentially uh, my brother a couple months ago, and this was about a month before he got married, he moved into a new house with his fiance, and they went through some of his things, and one was this little brown leather pouch that had belonged to my dad, and he'd had it for 13 years, and he didn't have the stomach to look in it, because he knew it was my dad's stuff. And he looked in it, and in it he found this notebook paper, and it was just these three pages written front and back of, it was essentially a bucket list, that my dad had written down all these things he wanted to do with his life. And he kind of looked at it and he thought, oh, like this is important. He knew I was coming that weekend. So he and his fiance thought, wouldn't it be nice if we gave this to Lara as a gift? And we started reading it and we realized, you know, about 13 of the 60 things my brother and I just had coincidentally done in our lives. Like I've been to Paris, I've been to LA, my brother's gone skydiving. The funny thing about that is he wrote, Sky go skydiving at least once. So like he thought he was gonna do this many times. <laughs> Um, my brother recorded five songs with his acapella group in college. My dad wanted to do that, record five songs. So originally I wanted to do the LA Marathon because I had already done the New York Marathon and uh, I thought, well, I think I'll do LA. Then the list came about, you know, maybe two or three weeks later. So then I saw a run 10 miles straight and I thought, okay, I've run a marathon, but that wasn't full running because I walked some of it. So I told my best friend who lives in Los Angeles, I was like, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna run 10 miles straight, no walking at all. I've never done that before. Then I'm gonna finish the last 16. And she's like, no, you're not. You're not gonna do that. You're gonna be exhausted because you just ran 10 miles. Like, how, how do you think you're doing this? And she actually had only done like a 5K She'd never been a runner. She had just really gotten into walking, like using a Fitbit. So she's not like this pro runner. And she's like, I'm gonna do it with you. Cause you, we found out you could do it relay style. So she became my partner and she did the first half and I did the second half. And it became this great like girl power kind of thing. By doing something kind of crazy that I wasn't sure if I could do, I inspired someone else to join me who I'm really close with and she is affected now. So it's like taking this great list and making these positive effects on people's lives. That's what I'm hoping is gonna keep happening. Well, Laura Carney joins us now in the studio. Uh, Laura, um, before the, uh, the show started, you mentioned that um, originally you didn't refer to it as a bucket list because your father didn't see that as, he didn't, he didn't obviously know he was gonna die. <laughs> so um, how did he how did how did he refer to it or what did you think? Um, it's just things I'd like to do in my lifetime. Yeah. I think he may have called it a life list, but yeah. um, I don't know if people really did that back in 1978 so much. And now bucket yeah. list is much a much trendier term. I think it originally was what I want to do before I kick the bucket, as though you're going to die soon. But now yeah. it just applies to any kind of yeah. list of things. Yeah. Um, so um, since all of this has happened, and since you've become an advocate and you've written about it. Are you more aware of distracted driving as you go about your your daily existence? Do you see it more? Um, you mean like in the past three years since yeah. I've been doing this? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I, I do take the train to work so I don't have to drive every single day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's almost like I can't look in people's cars anymore because I know I'm gonna see it. And, and I'm dreading seeing it. And almost every person I know who does drive every day is, just tells me regularly, oh, I see it so much more now than I ever did before. When you're driving in somebody else's car, when they're driving, do you think that they're, they're changing their behavior? Because if you weren't in there, they might be, you know, they might be doing this thing, but because of your... No, I think they've changed it for good. They've changed it for good. I mean, I, I, about a year ago, I went to my first National Safety Council conference and that was where I found out that hands-free and handheld is no, they're no different. So it's the same amount of distraction. So I came home and I told every single person I know, I'm not talking to you if you're driving. And I said, I'm not talking to you if I'm walking. 
So let's talk about the, the, this distinction that a lot of us have made between hands-free and handheld. What, what is the distinction and why is it bogus? <laughs> well, I just I just think it's there's not a, a lot out in the general public about it. Um, there have been studies done at the University of Utah and a few other places where you know they they managed to to measure what's going on in your brain while you're driving, and they found that the results were the same from handheld and hands free. And uh, I mentioned briefly in, in the piece earlier what what happens when you're on the phone, whether it's hands free or handheld is what you're seeing through your windshield. You think you're seeing the whole thing, but it's actually about four times smaller. That to me was frightening when I heard that. And I thought, why, why haven't I ever heard this before? And it explained to me how it could have been possible that the girl who ran into my father didn't know that the light was red because perhaps she didn't see it. Hmm. Um, if you could, if you were the type of person who, if you saw somebody distracted driving and you would go up to the, win the, the window and tap on it, what would you say, <laughs> what would you say to some of these drivers? You know, I, I've, I've been tempted, but I don't because that's making them even more distracted if they're looking at me yeah. and who knows what their reaction's gonna be. Um, I hope I wouldn't be in that scenario doing it, but if I were talking to someone who does drive while using their phone regularly, I would say, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll put it this way. Since I've started fulfilling my dad's bucket list, the way I'm looking at life is very different than the way I used to. Um, I'm seeing it as much more valuable because I have this list of goals of things I'm trying to accomplish. I'm not just like trying to survive through every day. I'm trying to thrive for every day. And my hope is that, uh, you know, if, if you like the idea of this bucket list and you like the idea of trying to accomplish goals in your life, you'll think about that when you're driving. Um, I went to a defensive driving course a few weeks ago, and the man who ran it said, if, if you're trying to prevent a crash from happening, don't look at the crash. Look at where you're going. Look at what's ahead of you. And he actually said, I'm looking into my future, which I thought was so interesting because the road is a great metaphor for life. Look where you want to go. Don't be caught up in the present moment. If your phone rings or you have a text coming in, it's okay, you don't have to check it right now because you're going somewhere. You have plans, you have goals. And you know that's essentially what I'm trying to do with this list. It's really, it mirrors each other really nicely, I think. So you've, you've taken your, your, the, the tragedy uh, of your father, your father's death, and you've turned it not just into a, a crusade, but you've kind of connected it to life, which is, you know, the problem is not just looking down, it's what causes you to look down because you're worried about the next meeting, you're worried about the text you're missing. You're saying that there's a more holistic way to live, to live well, your it's, life. Well, it's values. I, I heard on NPR this morning, someone was talking about, there was a study done that said even people who are the most educated are still very religious. Mm -hmm. Why is that? That's, that's values, that's, yeah. that's faith, I think. And, and I think it, what we're talking about here is a larger issue. I think it's a larger lifestyle issue. Right. People are distracted by phones all the time, not just when they're driving. Right. Well, Laura, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, people will tell people how to get in touch with your organization. So the myths surrounding distracted driving, like I don't have to worry, we were just talking about it, I use a hands-free device, and more when we look at how the phone has gone from being a device we use to one that uses us when Carpe Diem continues. Hey, what's taking you so long? Be out in a minute. talk to you about something. Welcome back to Carpe Diem, the myths surrounding distracted driving. Our next guest helps us puncture some of them. She's Kristen Olson of the Brain Injury Alliance of New Jersey. The Alliance is a statewide nonprofit organization that advocates for individuals impacted by brain injury and one of the main causes is motor vehicle crashes. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So what are the different types of distracted driving? There are three main types. Okay. Um, and keep in mind, not all of them are mutually exclusive. So there's manual, visual, and cognitive. Uh, manual is kind of the one people are most familiar with. That's texting on your phone. That's using Spotify and Pandora to change your music. Um, visual is things like, you know, seeing a dog on the road, you're looking, you're 
passing the dog and your, your mind is is focused on that not the car not you know the road right. um, visual can be checking a map it can be um, glare from the sun um, and then there's cognitive and that's where things get really complicated um, that's where you don't even realize you have a distraction so that can be again checking your map is a form of cognitive so wait um, so even looking down I'm, I'm, I have my Google map set and I don't know if I make a left or a right and I look down, that's... That's both cognitive, visual, and manual okay. because you're picking up, you're looking, and your mind is not so on the road. So that's a no-no. That's it, yeah, oh that's a gosh. huge... I know. Okay. So one of our um, strategies for, for getting rid of that distraction is studying your map before you get in the car. Um, look at ways, look at Google Maps and know your exits, know where you, you, know, you need to be to the left or to the right. So. Wow, I'm, I'm right. sitting here with that, the next question because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Yeah. So what are some of the myths? So one of the myths, uh, you know, is it's okay. I'm, I'm looking down on Google Maps or, or, mm -hmm. or Waze. Give us some of the myths that we kind of convince ourselves it's okay to do that leads to injuries and deaths. One of the myths is even just... Um, voice recognition on a GPS or a hands-free, for example. Um, people think that that's substantially safer. So why isn't, hands, why isn't voice recognition substantially safer? It's a cognitive distraction. But why is that any different than if I'm, I'm driving along and, and my wife who's sitting next to me says, Mark, make a left turn? It's not different. Your wife is a distraction. I would never say that. I know, I know. So that's really <laughs> the struggle. She might say that about me, but right. I would never say that I about I know. Her. So that's kind of one of the myths, too, is that it's really the driver's responsibility to not be distracted, but passengers can be distracting. Pets in the back seat can be distracting. Um, people on the road that aren't meaning to distract you can be distracting. Okay, so without minimizing anything that mm -hmm. you're saying, um, doesn't it uh, work against your argument if you're saying that... Um, um, devices are obviously distracting, but if you're then saying the radio is distracting, your partner is distracting, the dog barking in the back seat mm -hmm. is distracting, in a way that kind of brings us back to what do we what do we do? You know, in other right. words, as opposed to th right. saying or feeling that this is a problem, we we as as smart human beings can figure out solutions for. It's almost like, oh my gosh stay home right. in the corner and not go out. Right, which obviously we can't do right. um, in this society, especially in New Jersey, you need a car to get everywhere you're, you're going. Um, what we try to stress is just try to minimize those distractions as much as possible. Um, instead of having your passenger be, you know, entertainment for you conversationally mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, um, have them be your co-pilot and it can't be distracting in terms of you know don't fight over what lane you're in um keep no. in mind yeah <laughs> i know it's so hard to do but it's really so important to just keep your mind on the road and your hands on the wheel how do these myths take form like where did the myth start that um hands free or or um you know the the verbal you know the voice coming out of the phone is is safer like why do why do we do we believe them because we want to believe them or is is are, are the, the the cell phone providers and the hardware providers um, convincing us of something that's not true like who's right. to blame on this um, you know I think it's it's both um, it's you yourself and not knowing the facts um, and then it's also the technology I mean every day it's evolving um, cell phones 10 years ago did not have GPS on them you right. had to know where you were going you know, you would study MapQuest and print out your directions and know where you were. Now there's music to play in your car. Now there's um, apps to tell you when a vehicle is stopped on the side of the road. And it's just evolving. And I don't know that, I think the data will evolve. And I think the myths will start to change. But how will the myths change if, as you just said, mm. there's more stimuli coming at us now than there were five years ago? I bought a new car last year and I have a little dashboard and I can see my right. Spotify and I can play my podcast and then that's over road by the sound of my my directions coming right. in. I have more stimuli. So why will that change? Why won't it get worse? You know, I guess we can't predict that. Yeah. Um, but that's why education is so important before a crash happens. Um, that's why, you know, we work with high schools around the state to kind of you know, contact new drivers as soon as they're on the road and teach them about these dangers and just prevent. So yeah. let's talk about that. I know the Alliance sponsors the You Got Brains Champion Schools program throughout the state. What's the purpose of the program? Tell us about it. How do you how do you get into those into the minds of of new drivers? 
So the main purpose of the program is to persuade the students to persuade their peers um, because we found that lectures don't work, um, fear tactics don't work. They don't? Um, no, okay. no, they've been proven to just not, um, until you're in the situation you may not understand, but what does work is peer pressure, if you will. Okay. Um, teaching your peers, you know, being in the car with your friend and saying, Evan, don't look at Spotify, let me take the phone, or I'll call John and tell him we're on our way. Um, so, so it's, it's kind of similar to uh, friends don't let friends uh, dri drive after drinking. I mean, it's, yes. it's that same right. kind of approach. Friends don't let friends drive distracted. I knew I was close. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, it, so, keep, so how does that work? So we work with 65 high schools across 18 counties in New Jersey right now, and what they do is create their own campaigns um, in their local districts um, using local law enforcement, using social media, using um, TV production, um, whatever they have available to them. And they distribute this campaign across their school and we analyze the driving behavior. Um, and then at the end of the year, the students showcase their projects. And What kind of projects? Uh, so it's their campaign. So some of them will perform a song they wrote about distracted driving. Um, some will give speeches. Um, you know, it's really, the schools are, incredibly creative and incredibly intelligent with and they care so much about distracted driving and teaching their peers to drive safe um, and then in the end if they win they get a driving simulator for their school district to start teaching their peers in real time before they're on the road how to drive safe and how to avoid these distractions S since you started the program how long has the program been in existence it started in 2010 okay so seven years right. Have you, have you been able to quantify any impact that the program has had in terms of um, you know, progress toward getting younger drivers to start off mm -hmm. you know, on the yeah. right foot? Yeah, actually, um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Research Institute um, evaluated the program, and they found that it did, in fact, change driving behavior um, in our state especially in the students that you know took part in the program and then so there's that and then there's what we can't measure which is how much these students really care and when they're in the car with their friends are they following through um, you know with what they've learned and with what they preach are they and you can't tell that right right uh, yeah. we hope so and you know what we truly see it in them um, our showcase is really an amazing event where the students just I mean it comes out so much how much they care it's amazing to see a room of 700 high school students um, cheering for driving safe Wow. So, um, we're talking about high school students. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in, from my own personal experience, and I'm not exempting myself, this is uh, a, a problem that really transcends any age group. Absolutely. So, yeah. it's great that what you're doing in terms of starting new drivers off, but what about us, us older folk? What about, you know, I, I'll just go to the supermarket and just, it's, seven minutes from my house right. and I'll, you know, there'll be three incidents on the way there. Right. Um, you know, as Laura said, you know, you see somebody stopping, um, uh, you know, uh, the light changes green and they don't go and your assumption is that they're doing, they're looking down. Mm -hmm. So what about the rest of us who aren't 17 years old or, you know, and learning to drive? Right. How do you change us? So that's where, where our organization and our safety <coughs> partners really come into play. Um, we work with AAA, we work with New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance, uh, State Farm, off the top of my head, I'm sure I'm forgetting people, but mm -hmm. we do programs, um, we work together to really reach those target areas um, in New Jersey. So we work with seniors a lot. Um, you know, we work with, you'd be surprised at how much just their body and their body language can affect how they're driving. So, you know, turning your neck, learning how to see the road all at once um, out of just like, you know, Laura said, like this windshield is your world for the moment. So we work with all kinds of different prevention programs around the state, um, recognizing pedestrians, recognizing by bi bi um, sorry, bicycle riders, uh, motorcyclists, um, all bystanders. Uh, we have a ton of information on social media, websites, um, and we really work with the Division of Highway Traffic Safety to get that message out there. Over the years, there have been some fairly radical uh, proposals around the country um, to um, um, stop this, pro this program problem. And uh, among the solutions was some automatic shutoff so that when you got into your car, mm -hmm. you couldn't, you couldn't make a cell phone call, right. you, you, couldn't, you couldn't listen to music, you couldn't listen, to, listen or look at directions. 
Is that crazy? Or if, if, from where you sit and what you've seen with traumatic brain injuries, mm -hmm. if, if you could take your magic wand and wave it, is that something you'd want to see? Of course. Um, you would. Anything I could do to prevent a crash or prevent <laughs> a traumatic brain injury or a fatal accident, I would, I would do anything I could. Um, the fact is, it's not realistic right now. So what um, is realistic? Uh, what's realistic is education. <laughs> what's realistic is finding a way to speak to people. Like Laura's doing an amazing job reaching people, you know, of all different ages um, and all different experiences. And that's what we're trying to do as well. Um, you need to tell stories. You need to have conversations. And that's what's really important. Um, if I have a conversation with you, I would hope you might go home and have that same conversation with your family and right. your, your children and your friends and your coworkers. So what do you think... Again, if you were to wave the wand, what would what would you what would um, be allowed and not allowed in any car in the United States? A cell phone. So you would not. So in other words, it would be you'd be breaking the law if you had a cell phone. Right, which again is just not realistic. Um, I mean, there's so many different ways we could hopefully alleviate the, the problem in the future. Um, you so know, what are maybe some having of those a black box in the car. Uh, so how put would that Put your phone work? in a black box you in the back in of your car out of sight, out of mind, you can't, you can't reach it unless you pull over to a safe place. Um, but you know, we're a long ways away from that, unfortunately, yeah. but all we can do is teach. Well, this has been really interesting and um, eye-opening and mind-blowing, and <laughs> thank you so much, Kristen. Yeah, and of thanks course, to thank Laura. you for having me. Our pleasure, and thanks to Laura for joining us as well. For more information on this or any edition of Carpe Diem, Contact us at carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu or call, but not while you're driving, 973-655-5158. I'm Mark Efron from all of us at Montclair State University. Thanks for watching Carpe Diem and keep your eyes on the road.